Hello, welcome to the Bearded Tits podcast, hosted by me, Jack Perks. Professionally, I'm a wildlife cameraman, but I dabble in podcasting, and each Tuesday we release an episode as I have a chat with scientists, artists, filmmakers, and passionate people all about nature in a light-hearted and certainly not serious way. Hello and welcome to the Bearded Tits podcast. I'm your host, Jack Perks. Now, today's podcast is with Jonathan Ablett, and he's the senior curator for mollusks at the Natural History Museum. Now, there was only one mollusk that I wanted to talk about, not slugs and snails, although we are going to be doing a podcast on slugs uh, later in the series, but it was the giant squid. It just captures your imagination, this incredible creature that has slipped into myth and legend, many people not even realising that it's not a creature of fantasy, but a real animal. So I want to find out all there is to know about giant squid. How big do they get? What do they eat? Are there any other large squid species in the sea? So this episode's a little bit different because some of it is on Zoom and some of it is also in the tank room at the Natural History Museum where they have a giant squid in a tank. I get to go see one. Um, If you listened to an episode a couple of weeks ago, I was in the tank room with Rupert Collins and he's the curator of fishes for the Natural History Museum. So we got to talk all about fish. So we're having a bit of a Natural History Museum themed uh, few episodes. Now before we get to today's episode, I just want to mention buymeacoffee.com. Now this podcast is completely independent. We're not sponsored by anyone. The only way that I make money from it is through donations from you, the listener. If you would like to donate, it's roughly a fiver. It's the same as you're going to buy me a pint or a coffee. You can follow the link in the description to buymeacoffee.com, chuck some dollar in there, and it helps me keep going and doing this podcast. If you do leave a donation, you can also write a message and I'll read it out. This one is from Scott Bradley. He's put great pod jack. I find all your fish content really interesting as it is such an undiscussed part of our natural history. Cheers, Scott. Thanks for the donation. And yeah, uh, it doesn't take much for me to start waffling about fish. I really appreciate any support that people give me. I actually had someone who listens to the podcast get in touch and they wanted to buy one of my images for a um, county recording scheme. They said they couldn't pay me uh, money, but they could send me a bottle of whiskey which I don't generally work for whiskey, but I was like, yeah, why not? Ask them what whiskey it was. They said Talisker. I was like, that's my favourite. Thank you very much. I have a funny feeling they might have known my favourite whiskey was Talisker from this podcast. So um, yeah, I will work for alcohol as well, which was which was lovely. Another thing for you guys, if you want to get a bit more interactive, I've got a YouTube live event, a Q&A on the 21st of March, 2024 at 6.30pm. There's a link in the description. If you want to join me on YouTube for a live Q&A, Any questions that you've got about the podcast, wildlife filmmaking, you name it, we're having a bit of a discussion. I'll likely have a little whiskey or two when I'm doing that as well. Anyway, let's get on to today's episode. Let's get talking to John and find out a little bit more about giant squid. Here's our chat. So welcome to the podcast, John. Oh, thank you. It's it's, uh, it's lovely to be here. We're sort of doing this weirdly out of uh, chronologically because we've actually already met and done some bits, but it's going to be coming after this so people will have to bear with the timeline um a little bit but do you want to just explain who you are and what you do okay so my name's my name's john ablett i'm the senior curator in charge of mollusks at the natural history museum in london um so i look after uh, eight million mollusk specimens here at the museum um keep them in good order adding new specimens all the time updating the information and providing access to the scientists around the world to come and, and use our wonderful collection so obviously that's that's a hell of a lot of mollusks. We're kind of uh, narrowing it down a little bit today to some of the, I don't want to say more interesting because that's not fair. And I know that you <laughs> like everything, but to maybe some of the more kind of um, mollusks that have broken into the public imagination, which is giant squid or, or various big squid species. So um, we'll, we'll start with that. Um, I suppose the two that people mainly think of are are giant squid and, and colossal squid. So do you want to tell me a little bit about them? Yeah, I mean, I mean, they are fascinating. I, I cannot blame people for, for kind of, you know, honing in on those. Uh, and I, I think that kind of, it links back to this kind of, I don't know, sort of myth and mythology, this kind of, is it a real creature? Is it not, you know, sometimes I, I go to tour, I go and talk about giant squid and people are like, oh, I thought they were, you know, like unicorns or centaurs. They're, you know, not real. 
you know, you could be because they, you know, they have this very old mythology in sort of Greek legends, Roman legends, and lots of different cultures. There's Caribbean le uh, legends, I think the Lusker it's called. Um, there's Japanese and Chinese legends of these huge cephalopods, you know, grabbing ships or sailors or swimmers or fishermen, dragging them to their deaths. So, you know, it, not only does the giant squid a real animal, but it also, you know, inhabits our kind of our cultures and our stories as well, which is a, a really fascinating thing. Possibly something only other dinosaurs do as well, really. Um, and I think people love big stuff. People love yeah. a very large animal, uh, you know, something to do with the difference in scale. But also they're very unknown animals. You know, the deep ocean is a very different environment to our terrestrial land or even, you know, the kind of seashores and, and you know, kind of the rivers and the lakes that, you know, people are accustomed to in the aquatic environment. So when you have this animal that is a very different body plan, um, that is very deep and not known, I think it really, really sort of sticks in people's imaginations. And, and yeah, people really like to know more about because it's probably the basis of things like the Kraken, isn't it? That's that's where they're getting this from. But obviously, that's going to be a little bit of fiction. As far as I know, squid are unlikely to rise up and, and attack a ship. <laughs> but you can understand maybe, I don't know, if it gets caught in a net or something, and then the story gets passed around and, and quickly um, goes into that. But it, it's probably the basis for some of those legends, isn't it? Yeah, I think a, a lot of them to, to do um, where there was a lot of giant, giant squid tend to occasionally strand in large numbers. And we're not quite sure why. Uh, and this happened in Norway, especially in the sort of 14th, 15th century. And this kind of, you know, legends of um, sea orms or sea worms, and then later um, sea angels and sea kings, as they were called, may have been um, giant squid being found either washed up on beaches or floating dead at the surface. Um, and, or, and mainly even partly sort of the part remains of giant squid being found either in the stomachs of things like whales or floating on the surface and, uh, or even being sighted far away in the distance or floating on the surface. These kind of sailors and fishermen and storytellers have kind of, you know, made their own stories around these probably natural occurrences. Because I'm, am I right in saying as well, I mean, I, I, I've, caught, I've sort of singled out giant squid and colossal squid for today, but there are lots of species of squid that that get, you know, to quote, big. Like there are species that, you know, like Humboldt squid and I think a lot of the deep sea squid, they're maybe not big in body, but they're very long, aren't they? There's quite a few large species, isn't there? Yeah, you know, your Humboldt's two, three metres, fully, you know, often we use the term mantle length because, um, you know, squids and octopuses are a bit more, you know, elastic, jelly-like, they can... It's hard to fix a permanent length. So we often use mantle length, which is the length of the body. And, you know, for some of your yeah, Humboldt squid are quite large. Um, you have Halifron, uh, the seven-armed octopus, which has a wide stretch, you know. And I think the giant Pacific octopus, I'm trying to think, the, the arm reach sort of tip to tip, you know, six, seven metres. Um, oh, wow. Fully grown. So, you know, there are, there are other big cephalopods. But, you know, the giant squid and the colossal squid are a step above. You okay. know, if we're talking for giant squid, sort of currently accepted Total length is probably around 12, 13 metres. Uh, the colossal squid's a little bit more unknown, um, but I, I think a reasonable estimate could be between, and you have to apologise for quite a wide range, between 10 and 18 metres, I don't think is wow. unreasonable because no one's ever found a fully grown or even an adult colossal squid. So the jury's out if they're just bigger in mass or if they get bigger in, in length as well. It is crazy. In a, I mean, I guess it's frustrating from a scientific point of view, but in a kind of more romantic sense, it's quite nice not knowing everything. Maybe frustrating for you, but... <laughs> but no, but, I uh, agree. I like the fact that there are these mysteries. And so I, I, I've been at the museum 20 years and, and our largest, most complete specimen of giant squid, lovingly called Archie, uh, was caught in 2004. Uh, and what, so I've been talking about giant squid since that day, really. And the amount of new information just on giant squid that I've been able to add to my talks and lectures is is enormous um, in just in that 20 year gap. So, you know, what we know about these creatures is increasing year on year. So, you know, I, I, although there are unknowns, it's nice there are unknowns because there's things for people to then know. And that's, you know, <laughs> the joy of science is going out and, and putting knowns on unknowns. That's a, that's a nice way of looking at it. It Wasn't it relatively recently we actually filmed them in the wild? Because I know for a long, long time there was no footage of them, wasn't there? And then I can't remember how long ago, but it wasn't that long ago someone got one on, on a camera, didn't they? Yeah, so the first one was led by a team um, from Japan, uh, Professor Kubidera, and he uh, he got kind of footage, but still images. So he basically dropped a long line, uh, a baited long line with a motion-activated camera 
And I think this was around 2005, 2006. And they're the first images of the giant squid in the wild. And, you know, even though they're just still images, really interesting, um, seem to be a solitary animal and an active predator, two things which had been sort of debated. You know, large animals sometimes are, are ambush predators. But this seemed to be, a you know, actively hunting. And then um, a few years later, there was a, a big funded um, expedition. I think it was funded by, the, I've got a feeling it was the Discovery Channel. Uh, and again, Professor Kubidera was involved, but um, also a lady called Edie Bidder, who's a US um, scientist, uh, as well as a few other international squid scientists, sort of went out on a, a huge research vessel to try and find them. And again, uh, this was the first time that there was images, but uh, um, uh, a film rather than still images. Ah, uh, Okay. And for example, from there, you, um, because squid and octopus often are able to uh, change their coloration through um, the chromatophores and things like leucophores and iridophores, which give them more metallic um, coloration, you know, we were seeing these animals in these in these beautiful golds and silver, something that no, people just didn't know happened when you see the kind of dead or dying specimens that we're more used to seeing. Yeah, it's, there's always something to learn out there, isn't there? Um, do we know any of the adaptations they have to live deep? Are they kind of... Are they specially evolved to uh, to live down there in, for any particular way? Um, I mean, I guess the biggest one is uh, the eye. So in both, the, so the colossal squid has the largest known eye of any living creature and the giant squid, the second eye. Uh, in the largest individual the colossal squid, I believe the eye is around 40 centimetres diameter. Wow. And in the giant squid, it's about 28 centimetres. Uh, I believe there was an, is there's an extinct marine reptile, some ichthyosaur type thing that has a larger eye, but of the living ones, they're the two largest. Uh, and these eyes, when they've been modelled, um, they, they um, I mean, cephalopods in general have very good eyesight, excluding the Nautilus. Uh, and they have excellent eyesight. But what they've realised is these large eyes are excellent at seeing big blobs far away, which probably correlates to finding sperm whales before sperm whales can find them. So they've, yeah. they've when they've modelled them, they think that, you know, their eyes are very good at seeing the outlines of, of um, sperm whales from far away to try and avoid them. Because when you're getting a squid of, you know, whatever, 10 plus metres, your your predator really is going to be a sperm whale and nothing else. There's very few things in the ocean that are going to eat you, especially at the depths that you're living at. Ah, so it's not necessarily for predation. It's it's to get away from being predated, potentially. Potentially. Yeah. And of course, to find uh... prey as well. But but they, I definitely, in uh, I believe in, in, a, in a talk I saw a few years ago, Especially in the case of um, colossal squid, this eye, you know, was really good at um, seeing large shapes very far away. Wow. Well, that makes sense. I mean, do, do we know what they eat as well? I, I don't guess they're fussy, are they? But <laughs> Well, very little is known about colossal squid. Far, far less than giant yeah. squid. Um, I mean, colossal squid, for example, only live in Antarctic waters um, and are really very cool. In fact... Uh, they were discovered from the stomach contents of a sperm whale. The, the type specimens, the original specimens, were found in the stomach of sperm, um, sperm whale. We have them here at the museum. Uh, and most of the specimens that are found in nature are come from um, diet of sperm whales, all washed up. So very poor condition. Never been seen live. Um, giant squid, we do know a bit more. There's been quite a lot of fairly intact specimens found. And they seem to be eating sort of... Um, Fast moving fish, things like hokey and hake. Uh, that's where our, spe our specimen came from. I uh, was caught in the nets of a fisherman who is fishing for those two species just off the Falkland Islands. Uh, but there's also found remains of um, crustaceans, um, other squid species. Uh, a few individuals have found other giant squid tissue, uh, which ah, has led to a lot of kind of reports on them being cannibalistic. Um, whilst it's definitely true there were squid remains in the stomach, you know. Are they truly cannibals? Was this opportunistic? Was it, I don't know, yeah. a little bit of fighting that went wrong or some kind of, you know, aggressive mating? Who knows? But yeah, it's definitely been giant squid <laughs> tissue found in the in the stomach contents of other giant squid. Because I guess even though they're big, they're, they're going to be taking chunks of things, aren't they? So it's not necessarily, they're not eating things whole. So there's going to be a bit of detective work to work out what they've eaten. Yeah, I don't think it's an easy task. It's not something I've ever done or no. wanted to. But I, it's very, I think it's interesting because such a large animal, um, you know, they have these very small mouth parts, you know, they have, um, they have a beak like all cephalopods, uh, which is almost looks like a parrot beak um, made of chitin. This, uh, it's a very hard structure at the biting end. Um, and they basically have to mash their food up because, because of their body plan. Um, I mean, they're, they're cephalopods. The head is next to the feet. That's basically what that means in Latin. Uh, and so, uh, if you think about the a squid, you've got the arms and the tentacles, then you've got the head. 
and then you've got the body behind all the digestive system. So the food has to go through the brain and the esophagus of a giant squid is about the size of 5p piece. I mean, who uses coins anymore? But if you can remember what a 5p piece is, I guess what, about a centimetre across, just over, um, you know, very small esophagus. So the, the beak really has to pulp and mash the food up and there's help by the radula, this kind of um, rasping tongue. So it's it's nibbling to death. It's not taking huge bites and swallowing them. Why? So that would probably, I mean, I guess this isn't unique to giant squid, but that would probably mean the prey is alive while it's doing that, isn't it? Or, or partially alive? You'd think so, wouldn't you? I mean, uh, whether they crush them, who knows? You know, yeah. I, I often wonder this, and that's one of the, you know, the great mysteries of deep sea animals is, you know, we often see them uh, either dead or dying. Or are they behaving as they do when you've got a massive submersible shining lights possibly dazzling yeah. them? <laughs> you yeah. know, how are they behaving in any way? But the way I imagine it is, yeah, you're, they're using their arms um, to hold on to the prey and they're taking small bites out of, yeah, a properly living or a very unhappy or on the way out um, organism that has become its prey. You mentioned, so when when were colossal squid discovered? That's more recently, did you say? Yeah, uh, ooh, um, I want to say off the top of my head about 1930s by a man called oh. Robson, who's actually worked at the museum here. Wow, so less than 100 years ago. We, we've yes. discovered this colossal squid. Do you think it's possible there's there's anything else out there? Do you think there's some unknown, <laughs> undiscovered big squid out there? Oh, I, do you know what? Probably. Like, yeah. I don't know if it's just the kind of romantic scientist in me, but, you know, yeah. I, I, I don't like it when people say we know very little about the, the deep sea. I, I think that's, I don't think that's true anymore. I think maybe it was, but I think there's so much research. We know loads about the deep sea, but the deep sea is vast. Uh, I, I think it's better to say that our knowledge is always increasing over a previously poorly known. So we are learning more. Are there likely to be huge squid? Maybe not as big as a giant squid, but I would not be surprised if there were other large squids. I think the thing that the, the reason I don't think there probably is, is be, although I would love it, uh, <laughs> is, is sperm whales are much better at surveying the deep ocean through their diet. And because many countries have had a whaling um industry and their history uh, and scientists have often been allowed to go through the stomach contents of these i, th I think we would have come across something um uh, if it had been but you know never say never yeah no that that makes com complete sense um you mentioned um archie so the scientific name for a giant squid is is archi oh, God, i'm gonna butcher this now archituthis no is that right or yeah, something archituthis ducks okay the right. squid, yeah. so what what where does that come from where does the scientific name come from um archie oh do you know what this is testing my latin uh i think it's, it's a king <laughs> king of the squid basically king of the squid okay well so it's quite a fitting fitting i suppose this is before they know about colossal squid now might be kind of yeah exactly pretty... so colossal squid is, is uh mazonica toothless hamilton i so dedicated to a hamilton actually i'm not sure who that hamilton is um but yeah uh yeah mazonica toothless is the scientific name for the colossal squid and they're not closely related i mean they are all squid but they're yeah. not in the same um family so and in fact the, the strange thing is um, colossal squids, sort of nearest neighbours, the, the what they call the glass squids, really, are generally quite small, um, you know, under 10 centimetres, you know, not huge at all, and, and often see-through, as the, the name glass squids um, suggests. But this one just decided to book the trend and go nuts to the wall, basically, and get, get enormous. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, again, it's not my area of expertise, but lots of things do this kind of polar gigantism. There's some benefit yeah. where it's very, very cold to getting very big, having generally long life lifespan. Uh, and just getting absolutely massive you know things like the isopods you get these giant arctic yeah. um, polar isopods so yeah it's not unusual in nature no it, it's bonkers isn't it well by by the magic of technology i'm going to take us now to the <laughs> tank room at the natural history museum where there is you've got an actual giant squid specimen and we're going to have a look at that so john by by the power of technology we've gone from zoom to the natural history museum's tank room um can you just explain, like, what are we staring at? Because <laughs> there's a very long tank with a very big squid in it. So this is the largest uh, wet specimen we've ever preserved here at the museum. Uh, and in this uh, very long uh, tank, there are two specimens. There is a, an entire giant squid and half a colossal squid. Oh, that is. I, I was trying to work out what the other one is. So that's a colossal squid. It's yeah. It's half, half just one. the head and the <laughs> arms and tentacles of a colossal squid. But our wow. lovely giant squid here is complete. That is bonkers. So, so how how did the museum end up with these? 
So, uh, I'm trying to think of the date now. It's, uh, so, uh, in 2004, because I'd been here a year, I started in 2003. In 2004, I got an email from uh, the uh, fisheries government uh, office in the Falkland Islands, and they had found a very large specimen, uh, a giant squid, that they wanted to donate to the museum. Oh, brilliant. Um, it was, so, the specimen was caught by a, a fishing trawler um, just off the coast of the Falkland Islands. Uh, it was caught at a depth of about 220 metres, uh, which is actually very shallow, uh, depth oh, wow. range for, okay. for, for, for a giant squid um, and because it was caught uh, in a trawl it was pretty much complete Wow! and so we believe this is the largest most complete giant squid ever found um, there are lots of larger bits been found but not one as complete as this so we know they get bigger than this but this is the biggest kind of complete one yes. yeah, so, okay. uh, Archie as we uh, lovingly call her is 8.62 metres but the estimation for kind of upper size limits is sort of 12 metres for a female, sort of 10 metres for a, a male giant squid. You say female, how, how do you know it's a, it's a lady squid? So actually most <laughs> squid, uh, the way to find out is to dissect them, okay. uh, look at the organs, but, but uh, giant squid are a rarity because the males have uh, an external penis... Uh, oh. which can reach up to a metre. Good for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no penis in the specimen, okay. uh, so definitely a female but also in many species of uh, squid and indeed other cephalopods, uh, one of the arms or the tentacle is modified into what we call a hectocotylus, which is okay. for transferring sperm. Because if you don't have an external penis, you need to find a way of transferring sperm to your yeah. partner. Yeah. So they have a modified um, limb, uh, which they use to pass or sometimes inject uh, the sperm to their partner. But, but wow. not the case with this species. That is absolutely incredible. I mean, like if you were swimming, say you're swimming off the Falklands... And this thing turned up. I mean, you wouldn't stand a chance, would you? It's like, people always go on about sharks, but I feel like if you bopped a shark on the nose, you'd have half a chance. If this thing grabbed you... I mean, you'd have to be incredibly unlucky. I mean, I'm exaggerating. <laughs> obviously, I don't want to scare Mungo. I'm, I, I know that the chances are, are, are pretty much nil, but I'm just... Um... So, so interestingly, that, that is a really interesting point, because people have seen giant squid at the, at the surface, but they have been very lethargic, and now we believe that they are dead or dying. Okay. Uh, in the 1980s, someone did a study of the um, carrying capacity of the blood of giant squid, and it's unlikely that at uh, temperatures uh, in the upper 200 metres that they can survive. They can't extract enough oxygen to stay alive, so we oh. don't believe um, that they are found naturally at surface temperatures. So uh, we think they probably exist from 200 metres down to 1,500 metres, maybe more, who knows? Wow. That's incredible. That's absolutely bonkers. And and this colossal squid. So what, what's the story behind? Has this one got a name, or have we just sort of? No, we never. <laughs> when, when when something's lacking a head in the it's, body, it's, yeah. it doesn't generally get a name. Dave the squid or something. No. So so this specimen, yeah, as I said, we, uh, the giant squid came from the Falkland Islands, um, now on display here. And then a few years later, in two oh, I've got my dates terrible. Uh, in two thousand and six, <laughs> um, some scientists from the British Antarctic Survey uh, were surveying uh, off South Georgia. And, which is a UK overseas territory. Uh, they're actually sort of deep line fishing uh, for Patagonian toothfish. Okay. And when they brought the line in, uh, feeling that they snagged a Patagonian toothfish, this colossal squid was feeding on the Patagonian toothfish, which they had indeed uh, caught, uh, and it was also caught on the line. Uh, unfortunately, uh, squid have a kind of weak point uh, where the, the mantle, the body, joins to the head, uh, and as they lift it out of the water, the entire head and mantle basically disappeared down into the uh, wow. Antarctic Ocean. Uh, they weren't able to get a net underneath it. And these, it's very interesting because colossal squid, uh, Mazonic Juthis hamiltoni, are not closely related to giant squid. They're two uh, in two different families. Oh, okay. Uh, and indeed, they don't occur in the same places. There's no crossover. No crossover. So uh, colossal squid only found in Antarctic waters. Uh, giant squid are found globally, uh, but not in polar regions and not generally around the equator either. Oh, okay. That's amazing. So, and, and the classic thing with colossal squid is the claws, or I don't know if the claws is an accurate term, but the hooks on the suckers, is that right? Yeah, the, so the suckers uh, have been kind of uh, modified through evolution into these kind of, almost like cats, kind of Yeah, they claws, do look cat-like, don't they? Yeah, talons. Uh, and when the specimen is fresh, they actually rotate uh, wow. in, the, in the socket uh, and that happens, uh, you can see, yeah, along the tentacle club here. Whereas giant squid have that more classic squid, circular, toothed uh, sucker ring. It's quite, it's almost convenient. It's like you've almost laid it out this way, John. <laughs> but you've got, the, you've got the giant squid sucker below and the 
uh, colossal squid above. But yeah, you can very clearly... They almost look like anemones attached to the sucker. They're this big circular... Well, suckers, aren't they, basically? Yeah, and in fact, the, the group of squid, the colossal squid, begins to see the cranked squids, uh, these kind of hooks are a marked feature of the family. Right. Although most of the other uh, species, in fact, pretty much all of the species in this group, are very, very small, you know, 10, 15 centimetres. Oh, right, so OK. We think this is a kind of a case of that kind of polar gigantism, okay. where things get very, very big, where it's very, very cold. And am I right in saying colossal squid are the heaviest and giant squid are the longest? Uh, the, or maybe not long. Okay. So the jury's out. It's, okay. it's, it, there's not enough information. The okay. colossal squid are definitely heaviest. Okay. So the heaviest species of, of squid I've ever found is is a, is a colossal squid. Okay. Uh, we not. They haven't found a fully mature adult colossal squid yet. Oh, okay. So only submature. Oh right, so they they almost certainly get a lot bigger then. So they or get bigger. bigger, but how bigger they get? Yeah. I, okay. From memory, I think uh, the largest individual found was about nine and a bit meters for the colossal squid. So okay, that's uh, still <laughs> it's, it's pretty pretty big. Yeah, it's not but, far off the giant squid then, is no, it? No, no, and in fact they may get bigger than giant squid. It's just that so no. few have been found. Got you. Okay. And in fact, for both species, the majority of specimens that are found come from the uh, the stomach contents of sperm whales. Ah, uh, okay. So when, um, you know, when we had a whaling industry in the UK, um, they'd often have scientists on board who'd go through the stomach contents of sperm whales, um, sperm whales um, being much better at catching these than we seem to be. Um, and in fact, we have uh, probably around 100 bits of giant squid, maybe 50 bits of colossal squid, almost entirely from stomach contents of sperm whales. Usually, Just undigested sort yeah, of Yes, so partly digested. Okay. Uh, in fact, the colossal squid was first described from a partially digested uh, couple of individuals. Wow. Um, most of them are in very poor condition, just uh, usually the beaks, one of the few hard structures. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but occasionally you do get larger bits of tissue. That's incredible. They're, they're just crazy looking things, aren't they? That is mental. The, si- the size of this giant squid, I mean, it is... I can see why you've got it on display, because to members of the public, you might, you know, you're reading a, a book, you know, children's book of squid or whatever, a very niche book, <laughs> but... Um, until you actually see it. Am I, am I right in saying they got the biggest eye in the natural kingdom? Or so one? colossal squid has the largest... They do, OK. Uh, I have, uh, the, the largest specimen is around 40 centimetres. Uh, giant squid, uh, this specimen here is about 28 centimetres in diameter. Wow. I believe there was some, uh, an extinct marine reptile had a larger eye, but of okay. extant species, yeah, these are the two big ones. The, one, the ones that are still knocking about now, the, these, are, these are the ones. And do you, do you get giant squid... In European waters, like, would you get them in anywhere in Europe? You do, you do. Um, one washed up very recently in Spain and Portugal. Uh, we have one in a, in a tank in the corner of the room uh, that washed up in uh, Yorkshire in 1936. No way! The only have... UK record. Can UK we see? Is it, is it around? Is it... It's, um, unfortunately, it's sealed in. It's sealed. It's sealed in a tank. It's not in great condition. All right, but, um, but other um, uh, giant squid have washed up in Ireland and in Scotland. Because I was going to ask you, do, do, yeah, I mean, it's not like you're seeing them regularly. But, yeah, so technically we, we could get them, or we do get them in our waters We then. do, we do. Wow. I would never have thought that. That's incredible. So you tend to get large numbers where you get deep water meeting continental crust and you get the upwelling of nutrients. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, yeah, they do occasionally uh, appear on our shores. That is mental. Well, it's amazing to see uh, Archie. And the name, because scientific name, is that right? Is that how he got his name? Yes. Or, is it, co- or is, is it coincidence? <laughs> the scientific name is Archituthis ducks. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I've got shortened to Archie. That is amazing. Well, look, thanks for showing me, John. This is an incredible animal and amazing to see it in the flesh. That was John Ablett showing me giant squid, colossal squid in the tank room. I really enjoyed that. It was absolutely amazing. If you do get an opportunity, I cannot recommend enough Go to the Natural History Museum in London and go to the tank room. See behind the scenes. There are some crazy specimens there. Um, Unfortunately, we didn't get to look at some of the the bigger stuff that was hidden away. But next time, I'd love to to see that. The giant squid's pretty cool to see. I can't really grumble. Now, if you want to help the podcast but you can't afford to donate, one of the things that you can do is leave a review. Wherever you listen to this podcast, if it's Apple Podcasts, if it's uh, iTunes, whatever, I don't know, whatever the fuck you listen to this thing on, please leave a review. It massively helps me out and it only takes you a couple of seconds to do so. And obviously if you can share it around and let other people listen, then that helps massively as well. So one of the things I've started doing in these videos is recommending YouTube videos to watch on my channel because there's about 800 odd, there's a lot to look at. So this week's is a Q&A that I did with Jeremy Wade 
for Britain's Hidden Fishes. If you don't know, Britain's Hidden Fishes was a one-hour documentary that I made. Um, if you, I'm, I'm going to be doing updates on that in the YouTube video uh, live as well. Uh, I'm still plugging away at it. Um, but yeah, we, we chat for about half an hour. We take questions from the audience. We talk about all sorts. It's a really interesting video. It's on YouTube. You can watch it there. I'll leave a link in the description because a few of you might find that interesting. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Now, this is normally the bit where I plug next week's podcast. Obviously, we release podcasts every Tuesday. I haven't recorded next week's podcast yet, so I'm going to leave it a little surprise. I will have something ready by next Tuesday, but I haven't recorded it yet. This has been the Bearded Tits podcast. I've been your host, Jack Perks, and I'll see you next Tuesday. Cheers. <laughs>